So I needed to build an AF amplifier for a regenerative receiver that I'm building. If this was a one-off design that I was building for myself, I'd probably just use an LM386 or an LM380 chip and just be done with it. In 2015, Texas Instruments announced that they would discontinue the LM386 and the LM380. There are some alternate manufacturers such as New Japan Radio Company and Unisonic Technologies, but New Japan Radio's NJM386 is also marked as obsolete now. The LM386 was one of the most common amps used in do-it-yourself guitar amplifiers and sustainers due to its ability to run off a 9-volt battery. It is also used in many homebrew amateur radio designs. In 2021, surprisingly, you can still buy the TI LM386 in a dip package from Mouser, but who knows how long that will last. You can also find them on Amazon and eBay, but those parts are often rejected or poorly performing copies. Some have reported 8 out of 10 LM386s that they purchased were bad, noisy, or non-operational. If you're designing a small niche product or a kit product, you have to think about the availability of parts that you use in your product. For a one-off do-it-yourself project, it's perfectly fine to use an obsolete part or a part you have on hand or you can get on eBay, for example. But if you have to make more than a couple, you'll have to choose your parts carefully to avoid supply issues. Now, there are many modern Class D audio amplifier ICs that are available in surface mount packages, but like switching power supplies, they tend to be noisy. Because I'm going to use this amplifier in a general coverage radio receiver, a Class D amp is not a great idea. I wanted to design and build an audio amplifier that would perform similar to the LM386, use a minimal amount of parts, and use parts that will not be obsoleted very soon. In fact, the amp that I designed can use just about any dual op amp and NPM PNP transistors with varying performance depending on the particular parts used. I initially considered building the discrete AF amp that's in the book Experimental Methods and RF Design. However, this amp was designed to drive a set of Walkman-like earphones, which are generally 32 ohms. It's not really suitable for driving an 8-ohm speaker. Instead, I came up with the simplest design that I could think of, which was an amp that I built way back in the late 1980s. It worked well then, so it should work well now. The amplifier consists of an op-amp voltage gain stage and an NPN-PNP output pair of transistors to drive an 8-ohm speaker. Feedback from the NPN-PNP transistor stage allows the op-amp to linearize the AF amp and overcome crossover distortion. Here's the schematic. You can see that it's pretty simple and uses a minimum of components. I used a 4558 op amp that I had laying around, and for the transistors I used a 2N3904 and a 2N3906 for the output stage. You can pretty much use any op amp with varying performance depending on the particular op amp you use. The best op amp would be a low noise, rail to rail, high slew rate op amp, but even the lowly LM358 op amp gives satisfactory results. In the schematic, I have a gain of the op amp set at 10 times. The second op amp gives a gain of two times for an overall gain of approximately 20 times. You can change R1 and or R2 to achieve different gains. In testing, I found that using 100 ohms for both R4 and R5 gave the best slew rate performance from the 4558 op amp and also minimum crossover distortion. If you're using op amp such as the LM358, then a 330 ohm resistor at R10 gives the least crossover distortion performance. For other op amps, you may or may not need a different value for R10, including not populating R10 in the case of the 4558 op amp. R11 and C4 on the output counteract the inductive reactance of the 8 ohm speaker load. This circuit works well with supply voltages from 9 volts up to 24 volts DC. When run on 9 volts, the maximum undistorted output power into the 8 ohm speaker was around 300 to 350 milliwatts. At 12 volts, it was around 450 milliwatts. At 15 volts, it was about 500 milliwatts, and at 20 volts, it was almost 1 watt. With no input, the circuit draws about 3 milliamps at 15 volts. 
the circuit is very stable without any motor boating or oscillation tendencies. Here's a look at the signal at the bases of Q1 and Q2. With the transistors being inside the feedback loop of the op amp U1B, crossover distortion is minimized as long as the op amp slew rate is adequate. You can see that in the transitions where the transistors are not conducting, the slope of the drive signal to the bases of the transistors is large. The faster the op amp can slew the drive signal on the bases of the transistors, the lower the crossover distortion that you'll have. This is the output of the amplifier into a 16 ohm load. I first breadboarded the circuit with parts that I had on hand. When I saw that it was going to perform how I wanted, I built the circuit up using Manhattan construction, as you can see here. Generally, when building a circuit Manhattan style, I use a combination of round pads created from some double-sided circuit board with a hand punch and pieces or strips of aero strip board. I have these pads and strips as well as various components modeled in Autodesk Fusion 360 where I can arrange the parts beforehand to optimize a layout when doing this Manhattan style construction. Once I have a board layout that I can visualize in 3D, I then go ahead and build it up Manhattan style. If you're not familiar with Manhattan style construction, I will put some links for you to reference in this video's description below. The circuit would take up much less space on a proper PCB, especially if you're using surface mount packages for the components. The main advantage of this circuit is that it can be thrown together from parts that you have on hand and none of the values are critical. As I mentioned in the beginning of the video, I'm going to use this AF amp in my regenerator receiver that I'm building. It can be used anywhere where you would need a power amp to drive a 4 to 32 ohm speaker. It also works well as a small guitar practice amp as an example. I hope that you find this circuit useful in your designs. I'll be covering many more manufacturing and design subjects in upcoming videos. Please consider subscribing to my channel if you like these kind of videos. Thanks and I'll see you next time.